several folks that filled in last minute and plugged holes that needed plugged and filled and we do appreciate your help with that and um, it's always a blessing and we did we did Don you were right we did have a relatively good crowd for the the week after and how he's got a lot of sickness going through us right now too so uh, that was a blessing to see so praise the Lord it's it's nice to not uh, always fit into the mold of normal right and uh, <laughs> be like everyone else so amen all right if you have a Bible tonight we're going to go to Jeremiah 31, and that's where we're going to start. We are going to read quite a few other scriptures as we go through. Some of them will be on the screen, some will not. Um, and if you need an outline, uh, hopefully you got one. If not, there are a few more on the Welcome Center if you do need one and want to follow along. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you right, right off the bat tonight, we're going to, uh, I'm going to stick pretty well to my notes, so I probably won't be walking around a lot and uh, that kind of thing. So I'll be a little bit more focused this evening on that than normal uh, because I want to get a foundation laid that will get us to where we see what we need to see so that we can be what we need to be, if that makes sense. All right. Um, I have, uh, I was reading a book called Real Christianity and much of what we're going to discuss over the next 10, 12, 18, 47 weeks um, comes from that. Uh, the layout, the design comes from this. And uh, I take a lot of his stuff and add some of my stuff and delete some of my stuff, delete some of his stuff, add some more of my stuff, take some of my stuff back out. It, you know how the cycle works. So, um, but, but I think we're going to look at a topic over the next few weeks um, that really, <laughs> really needs to be delved into in our churches today. Um, real Christianity. Uh, what does it mean? What does it look like? Uh, and tonight we're going to look at, as kind of this, just an introduction to get us going, uh, convoluted Christianity. Um, Christianity has been hijacked, if you will. And I want to look at how it's been hijacked, why it's been hijacked, and then what we can do about it. Uh, and that's kind of where we want to start and lay the foundation tonight. Uh, so if you found Jeremiah 31, I know you haven't stood that yet tonight, so stand with me. We're going to read just one verse. I'll read it slowly so that you can get your stretch out, all right? Uh, and then we'll have you be seated after we pray, and we'll jump right in. Psalm, or Jeremiah 31, and look at verse number 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. What an exciting verse. Just one verse. But isn't it nice to know that he says to us, I love you. And not just short term, not just temporary, but forever. I love you. You're mine. Uh, and I'll show you my, my loving kindness along the journey of your Christianity, if you'll allow me to. So let's look at that tonight. Uh, convoluted Christianity, how it's been hijacked. And uh, we'll, we'll jump right after we pray. All right, let's pray together. Father, we love you tonight. And uh, it's been good to be in your house and to hear from our missionaries, Lord, and to uh, really just to praise you for a little while and just thank you for your goodness and your blessings and for answered prayer in our lives. Uh, we do thank you for the service this morning, Lord, and for the crowd that was here and the kids and uh, the teenagers, Lord. Just uh, uh, you, you truly did bless us this morning. We're thankful for that, and we pray for the many that are still out sick, Lord. We pray that you'll touch their bodies quickly and get them back to us. And Father, we ask you now tonight as we open your word, I just pray that you'll bless the teaching tonight. Uh, may it be something that will truly help us in this area of understanding true and real Christianity so that we can display that to the world in which we live, I pray. Uh, bless now this time that we have together, and we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. We, uh, we just did a wedding two days ago here, hence the, uh, the new format of the chairs. If you don't like them, blame the bride and the groom. Uh, they set it up this way, and I said, I like it. We're leaving it. So, but anyways, um, we just had a wedding, and if, if you've been married um, or planning to be married uh, or you have attended a wedding or whatever, family getting married, doesn't matter. One thing we know about this, it's the bride's day, but with the bride's day comes a lot of stress. Click after click after click, pose after pose after pose, smile after smile, you know, you know how it goes. So uh, she's there, uh, she goes through a lot uh, of uncomfortable, think about it. her feet hurt by the end of the day, the dress is very uncomfortable by the end of the day, she's got yeah. creases in her face from having to smile for all the pictures. And so it has its difficult side of being a bride, it's exhausting and tiring and wearying and all that kind of thing, but it's also a dream come true. 
Um, it's the fulfillment of what you know they dreamed about since they were a little child. Uh, and so she doesn't focus on the negative side of that. Instead, she focuses on that groom that's waiting there, uh, that loves her no matter what, that she loves, uh, and spending a lifetime with him. And so their love for each other completely overrides the difficulties of the day. Okay, uh, they don't choose to focus on that. They choke, focus on the or they choke <laughs> on the marriage. All right. Now I, I, I say that, and we start with that introduction to kind of remind us that's the picture of us and Jesus. Okay, uh, Jesus is uh, 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 the bride, or I'm sorry, the groom, the redeemer, uh, waiting for the bride. Okay, uh, we are the bride. Of course, I don't know about you. I'm sitting here saying, "Come quickly, Amen. Let's get married. Let's get this done." I'm, I'm tired of being here, Amen. Uh, but we got to wait patiently on that. But uh, the, the, that 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 merger between bride and groom that will take place when He calls us to heaven, uh, that's kind of like the ultimate uh, perfection and hope that we're waiting for as Christians. Uh, we're living our life here on earth. We have the promise of heaven. We have the promise of eternal life. We have the promise of freedom from sin, the promise of living with Christ forever. But we have to wait until that happens, right? That, in essence, is what it means to be a real Christian. By grace, I'm rescued and redeemed. I'm forgiven. I've been brought into the family of God, into a relationship with Jesus. Eternity has been promised to me. But then God says... Now you have to wait for it to unfold. <laughs> you you got to be patient. Uh, you got to wait. And, 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 and the Bible uses a word uh, for, for this. He calls it groaning. Yeah. <laughs> think, now think about it. Think about the world in which you live. Think about the promise of heaven that's waiting. Think about meeting the Savior that redeemed you and, ha and realizing I still got to stay here until he calls me home. That's some groaning right there. That's some patience that we need to develop in our lives. So I want to start tonight, and I want to ask you two questions, and then we'll get into the... I'm gonna, here, here, I'll just tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a real long introduction, and then three short points, okay? Uh, so I know that you know, you're going to think, well, there's three points. We're gonna, they'll go quickly, okay? Because we're going to give you a real long introduction before we get to them, and then the, th the three will go like that, okay? First question. First question. You don't have to answer this out loud, okay? I want you to think about it. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Now, now we pose this question, and I know you're at church tonight, uh, but our video also gets watched by, by quite a few people. Uh, and, and so the question we pose to the audience here and the audience there is that question, are you a Christian? I don't ask, are you religious? I'm not asking, uh, you know, do you go to church? Are you a good person? I'm asking a question, are you a Christian? I'm not talking about using the word Christian in a vague, spiritual way. I'm talking about when it comes to you, your eternal destiny, your salvation, your forgiveness from the penalty of sin, your hope of eternal life in heaven, are you trusting Jesus and Jesus alone to save you? Do we have a personal relationship with Christ? Uh, are we trusting myself or my works or my church? Or well, I observe all the law. I, 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 I obey all the ordinances and I follow the traditions of my church. If I'm trusting anyone accept the saving work of Jesus Christ to get me to heaven and remove my guilt and my sin, I, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Real Christianity, that thought of are you a Christian, totally depends on one person, Jesus Christ, in my relationship with him. Romans 5.21 says, It is sinneth reign unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're not sure about that question... Are you a Christian? The good news is this. You can be sure about that. The people that say, well, you can't know for sure. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Uh, salvation is not a product of religion. It's a gift from an almighty God. It's not a byproduct of, well, I did enough. It's a, it's a free thing that Christ says. God says, because I love you, I'll give you my son, and we'll take care and square away that debt. Uh, so it's about my relationship with Christ. If I don't know it, um, hopefully through the lessons and the people are watching us online even, hopefully it becomes very clear to them what it means to be a Christian, <laughs> okay? Question number two, if you are a Christian, do you really understand and fully enjoy your Christian life? Do you really understand Christianity? And then do you have a, a, a life that you live that's enjoyable as a Christian, from the moment of faith, when you trust Christ, until the moment you see Jesus and get to heaven, it's very easy to get off course. Okay? Some of you in this room I'm looking at have been saved longer than I've been alive. Okay? 
very easy to get off course in that length of a journey uh, until we get to heaven. Sometimes it's very easy for confusion to settle in, disillusionment, discouragement. You can fill in the blank there as Christians. So as we study real Christianity, I'm hoping to maybe avoid the confusion. I'm hoping to maybe avoid discouragement that set in along the journey as we wait until Christ calls us home. Somewhere between meeting Jesus for the very first time, salvation, and meeting him face to face in heaven, we experience, a, we experience this thing called waiting. Waiting. Waiting is hard. <laughs> waiting is difficult. You ever turn on the news and the first thing you say is, oh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Every day you turn it on, that's probably your response, right? Waiting on Christ is tough. But the joy that we experience in the Christian life because of waiting sometimes gets replaced with anxiety, with fear, uh, with worry, with nervousness. The grace that God provides for us is overshadowed sometimes by the expectations that we have as perceived expectations that never come to fruition. Sometimes the victory we have in Christ is overcome by failure in our life. And we don't experience that joy that he wants us to have. The journey of the Christian life can very quickly move from, I'm amazed by his unconditional grace, to, I just don't measure up. I just don't measure up. And it moves from being a real, re, uh, a real relationship to a rigid religion. Yeah. A system of behavior modification rather than a walk with a personal savior. Big difference. Big difference. God's grace, we will see through this series, it does modify our behavior. Okay, We, we, we allow that to happen. That's what God wants. But sometimes we're prone to make... We're prone to feel like God's acceptance of me is based on my performance. And the reality is this, that's backwards thinking. And, and, and as you think that way, you're going to become miserable on the Christian journey because you can never measure up to God. God's love for you is not based on your performance. You don't do more to cause him to love you more. Does that make sense? There, there is no, the, he loves you, period. <laughs> okay? Doing more doesn't get more love. Being a Christian is overwhelmingly wonderful, is it not? Yeah. It's exciting. It's a great thing. But we also know there are forces at work in our life that try to oppose the joy, that try to oppose the peace, that try to uh, oppose the happiness of being saved. And many times, man, they work overtime in our lives to cause us fear and anxiety and worry and doubt and depression and discouragement and even condemnation. It's easy to descend into discouragement and fall away from Jesus. It's easy to wander from grace and find ourselves captive to the lies and the laws that drain us of our true joy and strength as a Christian. The journey's long. Journey's long. How many of you have been saved 40 years? That's a long time. The journey's long. And unfortunately, I hate to say, unless God does something really drastic this week... You might have a ways to go still. <laughs> Amen? The journey's long. Eternity in heaven seems like, man, it's so far off. When is it going to happen? Perhaps maybe you feel like my strength is failing. Uh, my enjoying the Christian life is kind of waning. I I'm unfit. I'm undeserving. I'm unable. Maybe you're disillusioned. Maybe you feel like as a Christian you've become defeated. And your discouragement is said, and you're despairing. And there's always a voice inside your head when this happens that says this. Why would he even want me? Why would he even want me? I'm not worthy. He doesn't deserve me. Can I give you the truth tonight? Jesus absolutely adores you. I don't think you hear that enough. Okay? It doesn't matter where you are, who you are, how much love you're reciprocating back to him. We talked about this morning. He absolutely loves you and adores you. Uh, he, you, you, may dis, you may find disappoint, yourself disappointing yourself, but we don't disappoint God the Father. Uh, we, we may not measure up in our own mind, but you know when God sees us, he sees Christ. <laughs> he sees the righteousness of Christ upon us. When you're weak, he's not. When you don't understand, he does. When you don't see tomorrow, he's already there. You may feel and wonder, why would he even care for me? I don't measure up and I don't please him. Here's the great thing about God. 
God is not in the measuring you up business. Amen? Amen. He saved you so that you don't have to measure up. Because if you're basing eternity on measuring up, you're not saved. <laughs> Amen? He saves you from having to make that comparison, from having to fulfill a checklist of rules, from having to keep all the law. He fulfilled the law, he said, because he knew you and I could not. In salvation, he gave you righteousness in exchange for your sinfulness. And although you and I are very honest with ourselves, and we know and will admit we're still sinners, again, when God sees us, that's not what he sees. He sees the righteousness of his son applied to our lives through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Romans 5 eight says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what you're thankful Christ didn't say, I'll save you when you get to this point. I'll save you if you can name all 66 books of the Bible in order. Because some of you would be in trouble, wouldn't you? When you can quote 27 verses of scripture word for word, I'll... when you've cleaned your act up, I'll... no, 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 no. Uh, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible tells in 2 Corinthians, He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God does not compare you to anyone else or anything else. You can't be accepted more in His eyes or loved more in His eyes, no matter what you do. You're His delight. You are His redeemed. You are His child. You are complete in Him, period. Okay? Uh, Ephesians 1, 6 says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. We're accepted by Christ. This is what the term we use when we know as grace. God does something for us we don't deserve. For one reason and one motive. He loved me. He loves me. The journey is long. It can be depleting sometimes. It can be sheer agony sometimes. The struggle is blinding sometimes. It's, it's time for the church of God. It's time for Christians to regroup. It's time for us to refocus. It's time for us to whew, breathe, catch our breath, and then change the thought processes of our hearts to being oriented around his word. To calibrate myself to realize my identity is not in my job or my vocation. My identity is not in my church. My identity is in Jesus Christ. There are some critical things we have to know about being a real Christian that we're going to start to cover. Here's, here's what I want you, I, I think you'll agree with me when I say this, I, I hope. If not, I'll blot it and not say it again. I think being a Christian today is different than you expected it to be when you got saved. Yeah. It's harder, but it's better. It's better. See, when you got saved, I'm like, oh man, life's gonna be great. Your sins are forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. You're like, oh yeah. And then you realize, wait a minute, I still have to deal with sin. <laughs> wait a minute, I I gotta learn. Wait, I gotta grow. Wait, wait. wait. And all of a sudden, that journey you were expecting to just be a bed of roses is a little bit harder than anticipated. But you also learn this along the journey. It's worth every minute. It's worth every minute. Don't give up, Christian. Don't sink in discouragement and despair. Uh, I know the weight can be hard many times we go through a life, but redemption is real. And, and heaven, I think, is soon. <laughs> Amen? I sure do hope so. Amen? And you can enjoy being a real Christian. We just need to look at some things and figure out how. Uh, first, we have to understand why the term Christianity doesn't mean the same thing to everyone. I, I, I used this word a minute ago, and I read this in this book, and I loved, I loved the phrase of it, so I kept it. But Christianity has been hijacked. Yeah, it, it really has. Millions of people view the term Christian through a phony lens, a skewed perspective, and things that they've heard, not things that they know. And so the, the, the word has kind of taken off. Every year, more than 10 million Americans are the victims of identity theft. 10 million. You ever been that victim? Anybody? Okay, a couple of us. I, I have years ago. Several of us have. It's a real thing. Uh, some cyber savvy, unscrupulous nerd figures out on the computer how to get your stuff, and then he, you know wipes you out or whatever. 
In 2001, a 20-year-old man was hijacked by a, a cybersecurity guy in Connecticut. A salesman actually stole his information, racked up $265,000 in charges under this man's name, claiming it to be him. When the man got all the bills and realized it wasn't him, of course, he started fighting it. And it wasn't nearly like it is now as far as the protection and the coverage and things that we have. He fought. He spent his own time. He spent his own money getting lawyers to try to fight this so they get all of his money back. He was declared innocent. It wasn't him that spent the money. He was, he was, he was you know, it wasn't you. It was identity theft. But he was left still with $140,000 in debt. Regardless, the Justice Department said it wasn't him and verifies this that he still had $140,000 in debt. I think about identity theft, and I thought this. Christianity today looks much the same way. Yeah. It's been hijacked. The name has been stolen. What do you think about when you hear the word Christian? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word Christian? What? Christ-like? Christ One answer. Wow. Okay. What's the first thing you think about when you hear the word Christian? That's all I'm at. Follower of Christ. Yeah. Follower of Christ. Okay, what else? What else? Born again. There's a lot of people that claim to be Christians that think they identify as a Christian. Yes. And that's where the delusion happens. Mm-hmm. What? Fake. Thank, thank you for being real. Because it's easy for us to sit here in Christian in church and say, follower of Christ. We know that. That's what it's supposed to be. But what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word Christian? <laughs> okay. Okay. They've done a survey, and you can do a survey on your own. Okay. Take any section of America, wherever you live, find a cross section of people, and ask this question. What do you think about when you hear the word Christian? You will hear so much confusion and so many different answers, it's not even funny. So what does it really mean? What does it represent? How has it been hijacked and redefined into our modern culture? And why does it even matter? I want to kind of cover that. Okay, I want to show you these things. I want to show you how it's, how it's behind, why it matters. And then, of course, as we continue our series of lessons, we'll see what we can do about it. I think, in all honesty, there are very few terms as misrepresented and misunderstood as the word Christian. Centuries old identity theft <laughs> from humanity has happened with the word Christian. Great perplexity of the term Christian, Christianity, and nowadays even Christ. Mm -hmm. well. Depending on who you ask, the name Christian has been rendered confusing and very complicated. With it, the message of Jesus becomes muddied. And complicated. The Bible becomes skewed and then grossly misrepresented because they don't understand the logic and the terminology of what a Christian even is. So I want to look tonight at three very specific um, culprits of why Christianity has been hijacked. Okay? And I'm going to give you three very easy, very specific, very real, very applicable. Okay? Before I do, you tell me. What has hijacked Christianity? What's the cause? Why has this happened? Complacency. Complacency. Yeah. That's a good one. Laziness of God's people. Of God's people. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? I know you weren't expecting to have to answer questions on a Sunday night, but... Distraction. That's good. That's good. Anybody else? Misinformation. There you go. Not enough spreading the true word. Okay. Not enough of actually getting the truth out. Sure, sure. Anybody else? Anybody beside this section? <laughs> justify what they're doing and yeah. somehow claim that Christianity allows it. There you go. There you go. That's a good one. I'm saved. I can do what I want. Uh huh. There you go. Good, good. Don? Sure. 
Okay. Same. Sure. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> okay. Which, which is true. However, we don't get to use that as an excuse to do a Bob set. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. True. Yeah, yeah. Not only are few willing to die for it, few are willing to live for it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Oh, those are good answers. Those are good answers. And, and, and I think they all apply, okay? I'm going to give you three very specific ones. Uh, and I think you got a blank for these so you can write them down. Uh, no, there were no wrong answers given because I think all of those apply very well tonight, okay? But I want to key in on three that I think are the biggest, all right? Number one, religion. Amen. <laughs> religion. You talk about something that has hijacked the word Christian, it's religion. Church structures, powerful denominations have muddied the waters of God's word. They've muddied the term Christian. Now, we do not have time to sit and attack every religion that's done this. We're not going to do that tonight. I think most of us are knowledgeable enough to know there are religions out there that are not based on this whatsoever. We know that, okay? But because of that, the word Christian, well, I go to that church, so I'm a Christian, has been muddied. It's been hijacked. Political power struggles by religious groups have, have muddied the waters of the term Christian. Man-centered movements have adopted the banner of Christian, but have misrepresented Jesus Christ. Religion. There are religions out there today that you would look at and say, they ain't practicing what Jesus taught. But because they're a religion, and many people associate the word religion with Christian, Christian is muddied. Okay? Uh, there's a Baptist church in the United States of America that practices a very convoluted Christianity. And they're anti-everything. And, and, and they present that in a way that comes off as very rude and hateful and mean and spiteful and negative. And somebody says Christian or even Baptist especially, oh, well, though, what's happened? A muddying of the term Christianity. Institutions hold people hostage to man-made traditions. There are churches today that uh, demand that you follow this structure, this ordinance, this, 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 and if you don't, you can't be a part of our church. You know what that's done? That's religion that has muddied the waters of the term Christian. Works-based salvation. What are we doing? We're muddying the term Christian. Because Christian has nothing to do with how good I am or how I perform in my daily life. Complex structures of false teaching. It's amazing. You know, some churches spend more time figuring out how to teach things falsely than just telling the truth. They do. They do. How can we come up with some manual that's so false, but people will follow because they want to be a part of our religion because that'll get them entrance to heaven? Religion. Religion has hijacked the term Christian. You might have somebody ask, are you a Christian? Well, yeah, I go to church. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. None of the teaching of those things I mentioned, man-centered movements, political power struggles, uh, traditions, works-based, all those things, falsity, none of those things are found in this right here. This is, this is Christ's original message and manuscript for Christianity. That makes make sense for the church? None of those are found in the pages of God's Word. Many of you, and I will not ask you to raise your hand, many people grew up in a religious structure that was confusing and even oppressive. Uh, demanding, uh, follow these rules or... Uh, we, we use the word today because it's easy for us to understand legalistic, okay? And you grew up in that culture where you do, you do, you do, you do, you do, and we forget that Jesus already did. Yeah, amen. And, and so uh, they've grown up in that. And they were raised to believe that the Bible was there, but, you know, the pastor would explain it to you. Uh, it's not really understandable by the common man, <laughs> right? God was only reachable. This has been taught. God is only reachable by uh, the, the pastor, the priest, a saint, whatever, okay? 
Jesus didn't pay for all your sin. You still have to keep the laws and traditions that are laid out for us in Scripture, and that's the only way of eternal salvation. Jesus, in his way, to them seems complicated, but if you think about it, what they have done is complicated the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where salvation is found, not in some religious structure, not in some religious ordinance, not in some tradition that man has made to say, follow this or else. These systems hold people hostage to fear and anxiety. Could you imagine me told at your church, if you don't give this much, uh, you're not welcome in our church? You say, oh, churches would never do that. You want to put money on that? You want to put money on that? Because they do. Well, if you, if you don't dress this way or talk this way or be in this many services, you, you're going to be on the, the, on the naughty list. And it ain't going to Santa. It's going to God. Right? And it strikes you with fear and it strikes you with anxiety because why? I can't measure up. We saw already it's not about measuring up. It's about a relationship with Jesus. Scripture warns us of counterfeit religion. Matthew chapter 24 verse 11. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. I'm just going to be very clear with you this evening and you can get mad if you want. I'm, I'm fine with that at this point. I've been here long enough. If you get mad at me, it don't bother me anymore. All right? I'm going to do it in love, of course, but you turn on the TV and watch just about any TV preacher. Yeah. And I can't put a percentage on it, but you know how many of them are just deceiving people. Oh, yeah. Oh, you turn 99%. All right. Thank you, Eddie. We have a scientific. <laughs> it's a bunch. It's a bunch. And the Bible says it's going to happen. It says many. It doesn't say few. It says many. False prophets shall rise and deceive many. I, I wish... I wish I had a dollar for every time I've heard answers to, are you a Christian? And they've told me why. I've been told I'm a Christian because I'm a mom. All moms are Christians. I've been told I'm a Christian because I live in America. America's a Christian nation. I've been told I'm a Christian because I do good things for people. I've been told I'm a Christian. I go to church. Lee Robertson, famous preacher from years. He's in heaven now with Jesus, but he pastored in Tennessee. Great, great work. Thousands of people in his church had a college and all that. Just a tremendous man of God. And they asked him one time in that large church, he said, how many people come to your church do you think are unsaved? He said, I wouldn't venture to, to guess any less than 50%. Yeah, yeah. Well, but they're there every week. Yeah. Many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord. And then I'll hear, depart from me, I never knew you. A lot of deception. Well, of course I'm a Christian. I pray. I read my Bible. Or, or, or I hear this one a lot. Well, yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. I'm a Christian. I prayed a prayer one time. Can I, can I just be real clear? I, I have no problems leading somebody in a prayer to get them to talk with God and understand you know, how, to, how to ask him for forgiveness and all that. I have no problem with that. But what we need to understand, if we're going to un un is unconvolute a word? <laughs> if we're going to unconvolute Christianity, Christianity is not, well, I said a prayer. Okay? It, it, I know Christianity is simple. I know salvation is easy. I know God has made it very simple for us to come to the throne of grace and to trust him and get forgiven of our sins. But it's not, well, I prayed a prayer. Okay? That's, that's, we call that easy believism. We call that, we call that false teaching. Okay? Yeah. It's more than just praying a prayer. Okay, there's a lot of belief and there's a turning of our hearts. There's all these other things that have to go into it that aren't necessarily works based. But but it's not just, well, I said a prayer. I'm saved. Many are deceived. No matter what it's called in those things I just mentioned a moment ago, it's not Christianity. But you will find that this type of religion is not encouraged in Scripture anywhere. If you think about it, man-made complexities and traditions... Uh, political power struggles, follow these rules, give this, whatever. That's far removed from the personal and loving relationship that God wants to have with us. 2 Corinthians 6.16 says this, As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That sounds pretty personal, doesn't it? And religion, as described in some of these things mentioned before, religion is completely opposite of a relationship. And so because of that, religion has hijacked the term Christianity. What's a Christian? I'll go to church. What's a Christian? Well, I'm a Pentecostal. What's a Christian? Well, I'm a Baptist. What's a Christian? I'm a... 
Y'all with me? Religion has hijacked it. Religion has hijacked it. Number two. Number two, and this is going to sound weird, but let me explain before you go, what? What has hijacked the term Christianity? Christianity itself. Christianity itself. Gandhi is quoted as saying, I'd be a Christian if it were not for the Christians. If you were to ask, and this has been done, so I'll give you a little bit of uh, a survey, if you will. If you ask the average person, listen carefully, okay? The average person. I'm not talking about somebody who's been in church their whole life and that kind of. The average person, what an average Christian was. And tell me, describe an average Christian to me. You ask an average person. Here's the answers that we're given. Ready? What is a Christian? What's an, I'm sorry, what's an average Christian to you? What, what does that mean? A religious person, someone who goes to church and tries to be good. Now, let me, let me be honest with you. None of those things mean you're a Christian. A person who thinks he's better than others, holier than thou. Can I, can I just say this? Well, we're not better than anybody. We're saved by the grace of God, and but by the grace of God, we'd be in their shoes. If we walk around with our spiritual phylacteries up in the air because we're so much better than we are doing more harm to the cause of Christ than good. Okay? So it's not, well, they're holier than thou. That's, that's what the average person thinks about the average Christian. I'm just being, I'm, I didn't make these things up, okay? <laughs> Number three, a person who is judgmental and always evaluating others. Now, I think there's a time and a place where we are to be our brother's keeper. Amen. And, and in love, we're supposed to try to help them through certain things. But it's not my job to judge you in the position that you're in and to say, well, I'm better than you and I know more than you. And if you don't do what I say is right, you're wrong. A person who's hypocritical and doesn't practice what he preaches. Everyone in this room has probably heard, hey, would you come to church with me? Now there's a bunch of hypocrites down there. I, if I asked you to raise your hand, we'd have them all over the room tonight. A person who is confrontational, pious, and likes to argue. Yep. Yep. That's what they think of the average Christian. Now, again, this isn't every Christian. This doesn't mean that you fall into these categories. But I'm saying this is, the, this is the survey that's done that says this is what people think. A person who is narrow-minded and out of touch with real-life issues. And, and let me expound on that one real quick. Because some of these do have a little bit of merit to them. Okay? Uh, you know, the church, I think... And I think you'll agree with me. I think the church is out of touch with some areas that need to be in touch with. And is struggling with some areas that they need to do better in. Okay? Mental health. Yeah. S single parents. Yeah. Yeah. Broken homes. Yeah. Uh, 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 special needs. Okay? Yeah. These are things where the church is kind of like, well, you know, God loves them. He'll take care. And this is things where the church needs to do better. Okay? So there is a little bit of merit to some of these things. I'm not going to argue with that. But I don't think we should be known as a narrow-minded person who struggles with real-life issues. Amen? <laughs> a person who's reclusive from people who are not just like him. Well, I've been in a church before that if you didn't graduate from this college, and if you don't go to this camp with your kids in the summer, we can't be your friend. Hang that garbage. I'm glad there's nobody in this world just like me. Y'all would all say amen right there. Could you imagine a church filled with people just like me? But before you get, before you go, yeah, no way. Imagine a church filled with people just like you. I don't want that. But, we, but, we, but Christianity has been hijacked, and the average Christian has thought of it as somebody who, well, they won't associate with anybody except this is where we got to get outside the box, folks. This is where we got to step out of our comfort zone and reach out to the very people that Jesus reached out to. Because we're tending to, in our churches and trending in our churches to say, well, as long as you drive a nice car and wear nice clothes and be sure to drop some money in that box back there, oh, we're, you're welcome here. But the guy that comes in with tattoos and piercings and not dressed so well, he doesn't have money to put in the box. We tend to put him on a shelf and say, you can't be used. Hogwash. Amen. Thank you. Real Christianity is not, I, I love my people that fit into my box. Real Christianity is I love people, period. I may not agree with what they do, but I'll love them. I'll try to teach them. I'll try to help them. I'll try to show them Christ's love. The last one was this, a person who is one-dimensional and only interested in other Christians. Now, that's a pretty long list. Okay? And I'm going to be honest with you. There are people in this room, as I said that list, I was watching you, and you were like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've been in one of them, mm-hmm. 
There are fragments of truth in, the, in those lists, unfortunately. In large part, it's a caricature. Obviously, somebody has painted a picture. This is what Christianity is. This is what we think. But there are some truths, and we can add our own probably thoughts to that list as well. Throughout the New Testament, though, God instructs Christians to live in a way that's consistent with the gospel for this very purpose so that we won't be a stumbling block to unbelievers. Ephesians says, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be named once among you. Philippians says, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. As a Christian, (laughs) don't take this the wrong way, okay? As a Christian, it's much easier to believe in Christianity than to be a Christian. It's much easier to say, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, mm -hmm." It's a little harder to do it. Every Christian struggles to make his behavior match his belief. We all do. Got questions after the service this morning, just in the area of loving people. How do I do that? What does that look like? Do I really have to? Right? It's hard to make the belief match the lifestyle. And because of that, we have a tendency sometimes with our lifestyle to tarnish the name of Christ and to further muddy the waters of the term Christian. We are his children, and many times we don't accurately represent the family name. I, I, I told you this before, but I'll never forget when we used to go out in public with my parents after church, before church, during, no, never during church, but uh, <laughs> during the week, whatever. My dad, we'd get out of the car, and he would say, just remember who you are. Yeah. You're a king, and you better act like it. He was known in the town, obviously, and wanted the name not to be sullied. <laughs> When I had youth groups, I would tell them every time we did a youth activity, we'd pull up in our van to McDonald's or wherever we were stopping, I'd say, hey, remember who you are and who you represent. But unfortunately, as his children, sometimes we we muddy the family name. And so Christianity itself sometimes uh, hijacks Christian, the word. Number three, let me get this last one. Oh, I had that verse up there for you, but we'll skip it. I already read it. uh, Culprit number three, culture. Culture. Again, Christian thoughts and uh, de- 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 uh, definitions abound everywhere. Satan will do everything he can to muddy those waters or mip- misrepresent God's message. Uh, you watch a movie today about Christianity and you realize, huh? Yeah. 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 Huh? You watch a sitcom where there's a, where there's a Christian in the sitcom and how, how negatively and weirdly he's displayed. You watch a news story. You know, people do crazy things. But when the word Christian is associated to the person doing Christian doing crazy things, it blows up. Yeah. And a bunch of Christian freaks yeah. doing something, and they say it's in the name of Jesus, and they're just a weirdo, right? Yeah. Many people like to co-opt the name Christian. Politicians are real good at throwing the word Christian into the arena of their campaign to grow their voting base. Athletes use the word Christian to, to, to say, you know, God cares about my career. Businesses claim to be Christian to build a customer relationship, and then when you get involved, you realize they're feigning their integrity. Christian can be merely a term of convenience, neatly morphed into a variety of situations to fit their necessary agenda. Christian is probably one of the most hijacked and misappropriated names in human history. The, the false accusations and characterizations that sometimes, unfortunately, are true, they, they, they overshadow the truth. And they overshadow the fact that there are people authentically and truly searching the Scripture to be what God wants them to be and to do what God wants them to do and to, and to live His message and to share His message. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, and I don't want you to take offense to this, okay? Not every church that calls itself Christian really is and and not every faith-based group 501c3 nonprofit that has the word Christian attached to it actually is not in the sense of what the Bible says a Christian is many use that term and don't even understand the meaning they just know it'll help them in their goals of their agenda and it all adds up to a very confusing picture of a centuries-old term, Christian. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says this, 
no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The degree that we Christians have a bad name or image because of our beliefs in Jesus Christ doesn't bother me at all. If people have painted a negative picture of me because I'm following this, and I believe this, and I stand for this, and I preach this, and I share this, I don't care. You can have a negative picture and thought of me. I don't, I don't care because, I, because everything I'm doing is based on this. Not everybody values truth. Have you noticed that? Not everybody cares about facts. <laughs> Authentic Christians find that their belief in the Bible is the source of their absolute truth. This is it. This is what I make my decision on. This is a fixed position. If the Bible says it, it's true. If it says do, I will. If it says don't, I'll try not to. Now, like Paul, sometimes I get that messed up. Okay, we all do, right? But, but this is a fixed position. I don't, I, don't, I don't base my beliefs on the ever-changing tide and ebb and flow of culture. Often Christians have a bad name, though, because of behaviors and dispositions that are inconsistent with this. So if they want to throw you under the bus and hate you and, and call you nasty names because you're standing for this, let them throw rocks. I don't care. But if they're throwing those rocks because you're inconsistent with this, it ought to cause you great concern. There's a very good chance in the middle of all this noise that many people have bad information about Christianity, including Christians. Maybe people today in our world, people you know, people watching us, have ruled out considering Christ and his message because of Christians. Uh, if, you know, if you know what I think I know about Christianity, uh, you wouldn't believe it either. I've seen this form of Christianity that is so radical and it distorts the truth. I don't want any part of that. Could I ask a question, though? Wouldn't it be sad to never fully investigate and understand what the truth really is? And so many people write off the truth because of what they've heard or what they've seen in the lives of others. Perhaps tonight you say, well, I'm a Christian. I truly do know Christ. But I kind of have had thoughts about, you know, I've got to measure up and I've got, to, I've got to make sure I do right or Christ isn't pleased with me. And you become gripped by spiritual exhaustion because of that. Wouldn't it be cool to be released from the pressure of feeling I have to measure up? What if we've been misinformed? What if there's a Christian walk and relationship entirely different from all these hijacked situations you know what there is there is there's a good chance that many of us over the course of our life have been given misinformation about jesus about the bible about christianity and about the call of god in our lives i'm going to say this and this is going to sound different from what you usually hear what you don't know will hurt you usually it's what you don't know won't hurt you, you know what you don't know in this area will hurt you if we misunderstand, that long road becomes even longer. If we don't uh, uh, study the truth, know the truth, and live and apply and share the truth, that disappointment, that disillusion robs us of our joy very quickly and very easily. And before long, that theological framework that we've been built up upon and we've been taught, well, my grandpappy and my great-grandpappy and my great-grandpappy, they all pass this down to me. It's got to be gospel. That's like saying, well, it's on the Internet. It has to be true. Come on, come on, we know better than that. But eventually that theological framework that we've been passed down is going to have a collision course with reality. And you know what happens when that happens? Most people blame God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is not what I... It doesn't matter what you've been taught. It's not, it doesn't matter what you think. What does God say? And when those two things collide, we tend to blame God. Worst case, we walk away from him and never experience the relationship he desires. Best case, we suffer and struggle uh, forward in, in spite of faulty beliefs and disillusionment, and we have a joyless Christianity. I don't know about you, but in John chapter 10, Jesus said he came to give us abundant life, and that doesn't sound abundant to me. Take a fresh look at the Bible tonight. Take a fresh look at Jesus tonight. Take a fresh look at his message from the Bible tonight and realize Christianity is a whole lot more than what is being portrayed as today. It's, it's more than a religion. And Christians sometimes hurt the cause themselves, and culture does the same. How can we take back the name of Christian? How can we unmuddy the waters, if you will? We're going to next week, 
we're going to go back to the first century. We're going to take a trip together, back when Roger was born. And we're going to learn where this hijacked term Christian really came from, what it meant at its beginning or its origin, and why it's important for us to know that today. And we'll look next week at the real Jesus. And until we get there next Sunday, <laughs> consider the, the statement that he makes in John chapter 10, that he has come to give us abundant life. Is that not the Christianity that you desire? Yes. Abundance with Christ. I would love to experience that even more, amen? As we study this out, we're going to come up with uh, the idea and the expectations and the realization of what real Christianity is is all about. Our verse that we read at the very beginning, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. There's a game show, I don't know how long ago, but there's a game show where they had somebody there and they had two or three people that impersonated that person. And they all had to, they had to try to figure out who the real Steve Johnson was or whatever. And at the end, they would say, what was it called? What's my line? And at the end of that, they would say, would the real Steve Johnson stand up? And, you know, they'd, they'd alternate, and then finally the real one would stand up. Through the next few weeks, here's what, here, here's what we're going to find out. Will the real Christian stand up? Will the real Christian stand up? Well, I sure hope that we can glean some truths from this, this journey and really realize what it means to be a Christian, how to live out my Christianity, and how to disprove some of these characterizations that people are associating with the word Christian. That's our job. That's our goal. Shine light on a confusing topic. And so next week, we'll go back to the first century and look at the real Jesus and real Christianity, where it came from, and take that journey next week. And John chapter 21 is where we're going to start reading from next week. If you want to read ahead, you can do so. We get all our blanks filled in tonight. There was only three. If you didn't, you're struggling. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for your truth. God, I thank you that in the midst of, of a word that is very muddied, very confusing, very uh, uh, hijacked, for the lack of a better word. I'm thankful that we can know what it really means. I'm thankful that it's about a relationship and not a religion. I'm so thankful that we can know you more and learn about you more and grow in you. I pray, Lord, over the weeks of these studies as we look at this topic, I pray that you'll help us grow in this area of truly understanding what real Christianity is and then living it out in our lives and maybe changing the paradigm and showing uh, the world, Lord, this is, this is what Christianity is. May that be our desire and our goal and our purpose as we study this out, we pray. Father, we ask you tonight as we go to our homes that you'll bless us, keep us safe, uh, bring us back again, Lord, this week, uh, this weekend as we celebrate and get together with God's people again in your house. We just ask you to work uh, in, in our lives, bless the ladies. Uh, dinner on Thursday, Lord, just all that's done this week, we just ask that you will continue to be uplifted and magnified. And may we live our lives pleasing you, we pray. May we share the gospel with somebody this week and be a light in a dark world, we ask. And we ask all these things in the wonderful name of Christ. Amen. Amen. We got all of our blanks filled in. Any questions, comments, thoughts, or anything like that tonight?